by. We're talking baseball history and Negro League history, card art, collecting, whatever your passion is about sports and baseball. And I'm really, really happy tonight to have on author, activist, teacher, you got all kinds of titles, uh, granddaughter of Turkey Stearns, Vanessa Ivy Rose. How are you doing, Vanessa? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. All right. No, this is awesome. I, I'm really, I was looking forward to this. I, For the last couple of months when, when you were announced as a judge for um, the Josh Gibson card art tournament, which I'm sure that was interesting behind the scenes we'll talk about that a little bit but i was uh i was thinking boy oh boy i would love to talk to her uh and 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 about all the things you're involved in and and about your grandfather i would love to have you on and here you are so i'm really i'm really glad that you're taking the time to do this tonight so uh I, we were talking before we got on here. I mean, the thing you know, I'm trying to do here is is give you know some voice to people who have been uh, the historians, the researchers, authors, other people who have been you know doing this for a long, long time to raise that awareness of and give context to the Negro Leagues. And um, you know, people like yourself are to me the next generation because many of the people I've had on have been doing this for a long long time and I'm really glad to see someone like yourself and I've had other younger people on as well uh, Alex Painter uh, was on uh, you know several others that have been on that that are are taking that next step but we need to get more of you guys and, and you know involved in this and and one of the things I love to hear is how I mean, I already probably know half your origin story already, but it'd be great to tell people how you became involved. I know, you know, your grandfather's legacy is very, very important to you. Tell us a little bit about that background. Yeah, sure. You know, being born into an amazing family where, you know, I have a grandfather who was able to make it into the baseball hall of fame is unbelievable, but um, I was actually not a lot. Well, he actually passed away um, in 1979. So I never had the chance to meet him. I never had a chance to have a discussion with him. And in my mind, I'm still, you know, looking forward to and envisioning what that would be like. So for me, my grandmother was truly the person who um, was able to impress upon me how important and significant he was as a baseball player and as a person. And over time, I began to understand, you know, his activism within sports and also, um, you know, the path that he laid, not just for me, but for all of us. So when I was young, of course, I heard all of these stories that were fantastic about his career and all the challenges that he went through. But over time, evolving as a student myself and evolving as a young person and then coming into social consciousness as well. I learned more than I ever could have imagined about, you know, what it must have been, what it must have been like to um, endure Jim Crow and be the person that he was and um, exist in the space that he did and learn how to thrive within that. So, that's right. yeah, I learned a lot over, over time. Yeah, and that's, that's something I think that, um, you know, as a teacher, let me ask you this. I'm trying to put up some of your stuff and I've got the wrong the wrong graphic up there but I'm getting there as a teacher dealing with younger people what, what grades do you teach first off mostly 10th grade but I also teach 11th and 12th grade as okay well. Ooh, that's a great that's a great age uh, because you know I, I have um, two sons one one who's just joined the Navy recently who's who's 21 I got another son who's heading off to college this year and I got a four-year-old as well but but <laughs> but the yeah but um, boy you know that age between once they start getting into middle school and into into high school that's you know they always talk about that coming of age kind of thing uh, it's an important you know, several years, especially in high school, because as a as a young person, you're you're trying to find yourself, you're trying to get your own voice, you're trying to do all those things. So you you are actually with uh, an age group that I think would be really important to kind of emphasize some of this stuff with, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I've I've been lucky that the course that I teach, especially within English, you can teach pretty much anything. You can apply music to that. You can apply sports to that, technology, media, 
Um, and it pairs really beautifully with history. Yeah. And if people understand the historical context of the literature, then I think, you know, it can open up so many doors for them in terms of understanding things and not just the way where they're taking in information, but where it becomes transformational for them. And so, um, you know, teaching English has really been a blessing in terms of trying to figure out how to impress upon this generation, you know, where we've been and also where we are currently and hopefully where we're going in terms of evolving into a peaceful, more loving, more just, uh, more unified society. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you, um, you mentioned it. <clears throat> Several other authors have mentioned this as well. Sometimes you can approach certain topics. Certainly uh, this past year, uh, starting with last summer, and, that, and that's the whole thing about this whole, um, you know, the rec I mean, they were major leagues all along, right? But the recognition of the Negro Leagues, yeah, the recognition of the Negro Leagues by Major League Baseball was a long time coming. They finally got around to doing it. Good for them, right? <laughs> but <laughs> I think most people, if you were, you were uh, uh, in, in any way a baseball fan or history, you understood the context of all that, <clears throat> and it was it, it was something that should have been done a long time coming. But a lot of these topics, sometimes you can approach certain things when it comes to, um, you know, maybe when it comes to the racial, uh, you know, uh, I, things that have been going on in the last year, uh, when it comes to other issues within society, through a different lens. And sports seems to be one that most people not even not just young people but most people are really a lot more receptive if you approach it you know kind of that way it smooths the edges a little bit i mean how, what do you how do you uh yeah. what's your what's your style when it comes to that i'm all about that i think you know a lot of times when students come to me they are not interested in learning classic literature they're not interested in reading and they're definitely not interested in um you know, just focusing on things of the past. Um, so using both music and sports and also movies too, they work really well as like a universal language. You know, that really is when you can draw a student in that is, you know, someone who doesn't already have that interest in English or they're not really academically studious or, you know, they just want to get the grade and move on. So figuring out, you know, how to light that fire in terms of something that they're already um, interested in, it seems like music, sports, and movies have been, uh, you know, the big connectors, but also uh, video games too, since we're on uh, Twitch. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's, you, you get it. That's exactly why I'm trying to use this because mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a, a way to um, approach people because, you know, when, when this is streaming live, and I don't know, you know, I'm encouraging people to do that. I think, you know, the views I'm getting, I was telling you this, I'm posting it on uh, several other forums. I'm starting to create clips and update them to YouTube. That's going to be coming soon. But, you know, it started out where I was getting uh, 20, 30, 40 views. Now I'm into the hundreds and if not thousands across all these. So it, it really is good. In one minute, buddy. I, my, my, little, my little guy here. You want to come over here and say hello? Here he is. He's back from <laughs> back from uh, uh, Mexico visiting Grandma and Grandpa. <laughs> um, a little shy. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. We get, we get him on here. But the um, the the thing about Twitch is it 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 because it's live. People can pop in and out from different. You know, they maybe are just browsing through, and they're browsing through. I have it listed under sports. I have it listed under. Uh, simulation games I've listed under uh, you know talk shows whatever all that topic is right so it, it throws up random you know things that are live at the time and sometimes people go oh hey who's that right and so they, they check it out and so sometimes there's people that pop in and out that are are um, you know if I the way I look at this if I could get even if it's just one person to start to understand the context and what this was all about, um, and and be able to put a different, you know, uh, lens on that for them, then it's worth it. I mean, it really, it really is. And so, so uh, there are so many topics that you can approach. 
using sports and gaming and other things in order to, I guess, it kind of smooth the edges on things. Uh, I had Andrew Moranis on here, and he has he um, is was, was involved with the Undefeated. Are you uh, familiar with that website? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure you are, right? Phenomenal. Yeah. Right, and so that's kind of what they're doing. They 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 have a a uh, uh, the ability to kind of take uh, hip hop and and pop culture and and things and mix it in with athletics and and tell some stories uh, and give context to things, and and like you said, young people are maybe more likely to, um, you know, watch it. And maybe learn yeah. something from it. <laughs> Undefeated. That's my love language right there. I, I, I yeah. love the way they tell stories. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Have you have you uh, been on there? Have you talked to them at all? I wish. Shout out to Undefeated. Uh, we- yeah, we gotta get you. Yeah, we gotta get you on here. I think I think you'd have a lot of fun on here. I think that'd be great. Um, they, like I said, they they have uh, so many great guests and people that have been on there, and the way they tell the stories, and and there's there's um, also I had on um, boy oh boy I can't remember the name of the website now, but I had on uh, where it was like kind of the Latin version of that. Um, nice. And and so you know there are other there are other forums out there that that people uh, just need to start to learn about because this story to me is really important and and the thing about it right I mean I have these conversations with people and I'm trying to get them to understand right first of all Negro League players you know you could call it that call it black baseball whatever you want to call it right they were not there because they weren't good enough to play in Major League Baseball they right. they were. And they were for a long, long time. And in fact, they did <laughs> even right. before, you know, uh, long before Jackie Robinson. And then they couldn't, right? Simply because of the color of their skin, which to me is, you know, right off the bat. I mean, it, it's something that, that that bothers me, you know, because I, I have, um, you know, my, my I guess my wife's from Guadalajara. She has a little accent. People make assumptions. They 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 kind of make, you know, their their narrative in their head and it, and it's not right you've got you've got to accept people for who they are what they can do uh and that's that's the most important part but the misconceptions about the negro leagues when it comes to the barnstorming and the structure of the league and everything else um people need to start to get wrap their heads around that the um the fact that they tried to have organized leagues, but yet everything was stacked against them. And that the fact they kept on going and persevered, people like your grandfather, uh, to me, that's like a great American story. That's Absolutely. What, that's what you do. You adapt, you overcome, you improvise, you, you have perseverance, you keep on going. And I think people could learn a lot from that if they just opened their minds up and started to uh, to uh, to you know yeah especially that. like you said because the adversity that they were facing I mean I think people really need to understand what was happening during that time how mm-hmm. different it is from today and I, would, I hesitate to say you know well it was so much worse back then and things are so much better now because I, I think it's a continuous um, story if you really look at mm-hmm. history and how it's evolved into different things and the response to each social movement you know like you said this past summer we mm-hmm. had a rude awakening many of us mm-hmm. um, that weren't really paying attention to the continuous story and have just been popping in and out or only receiving bits and pieces of information mm-hmm. along the way um, and especially based upon you know what our education and our upbringing is. Mm-hmm. but looking at you know how Turkey Stearns and Josh Gibson and Satchel Paige and all of them endured a space that they were not supposed to be in in the first place because essentially the Jim Crow era was seeking to destroy them, right? When you really mm-hmm. look at the Jim Crow laws and what they were, I mean, just existing was a problem. Just breathing was a problem. It's so ridiculous when you go through the history of those laws and you see, oh, you know, playing checkers with mm-hmm. someone from a different race, mm-hmm. you know, it's against the law. And then what does that really mean? It's not just like, oh, this is taboo. You shouldn't do it. You'll get a slap on the wrist. It really could mean anything. It mm-hmm. could mean that you are not just thrown in jail. It could mean that you are lynched that day. It could mean that you never go home to your family again. It could mean that you're severely beaten, you know, and that you're terrorized. Um, and I think sometimes some people don't realize the traumatic impact of that 
on generation, you know what I mean? And also on, you know, the type of mental gymnastics that those athletes would have to go through every single day to get up and begin again. Mm -hmm. No, I, I absolutely, I mean, that, that pretty much sums it up. You, every day to have to put your mind into that place just to be able to get through the day, you know, boy, oh boy, that's not something that um, I would think anybody would want to have happen to them. And then to have it based solely on one thing, I mean, it just was wrong. And then, um, as I've had these conversations, you know, tried to also stress, you know, people try to bring up some of the negative issues about it. Now, oh, this guy had a temper, this guy had this, this guy drank. They all did. I mean, you know, the, the, Gary, I think it was Gary Gillette mentioned that, uh, well, heck, if that was the criteria, then Ty Cobb, with his temper, never would have played. Babe Ruth, who liked to, you know, party a little bit, never would have. Mickey Mantle, all these guys. If that was really the criteria, then there were lots of guys. You know, baseball was a rowdy sport back in the 1800s. Uh, right. It wasn't. It, it, it was not the. That was not the criteria. They were. They were sort of trying to come up with reasons. And then, the people who kind of had the keys to the kingdom, the commissioner, and uh, you know even the sports writers in in many of the cities, they were spinning it to put everything. You know, one of the things. I mean, I mean, the Spink Award used to be named after J. G. Spink, who was with the Sporting News which was the Bible of, of baseball back in the you know, 20s, 30s, 40s. When Jackie Robinson broke the color line in 47, there's hardly any mention of him in the sporting news. It's like, wait a minute, are you kidding me? I mean, you know, they... Right, and that's intentional, very intentional. You exactly. Know, to try to erase the entire... I mean, that it, it runs so deep, like what you're saying, I'm just trying to erase an entire group of people, yeah, which we've seen in history before, but... Obviously, didn't learn a lesson. So you said that you're uh, okay. So you never got to meet your grandfather, uh, which um, you know is is unfortunate, especially. But you have a connection to him. Tell us a little bit about that that you were telling me earlier. Yeah, absolutely. And it kind of goes back to what you just mentioned. I wanted to touch on real quick. You know about the people partying and drinking, and that actually wasn't something that my granddad did. You know, he was very reserved. Um, he did not hang out after baseball games. He was not a drinker. He was not a smoker. He was not a partier. Um, he pretty much ate, slept, and <laughs> breathed baseball, right? Um, which is one of the things that I connected with him on when I was growing up and I was playing sports myself. And, you know, just becoming a teenager and then evolving into college, especially at the college level, you know, some pretty crazy things can go on behind mm -hmm. the scenes with athletes. And, um, so one thing that grounded me, especially, was the fact that I remembered how my granddad was. And so I wanted to bring honor to him and honor to my family by, you know, making sure that I was not out partying, I wasn't staying out all night and, and, and doing other things. I only had four years of college basketball, so I wanted to make sure that I was going to maximize my potential with that time. And so he helped me to stay focused, just thinking about everything that he had gone through. Like, awesome. why would I waste this opportunity you know, that's in front of me, knowing everything that he did in the past to make sure and to ensure that I could even have an opportunity like this. You know, I really wanted to seize the moment with that. So growing up, I just always had a very special connection to him through sports and then also through, you know, personality. Uh -huh. Because, you know, my mom would mention, you know, she's like, you know, sometimes you're quiet like your granddad or sometimes, you know, <laughs> you're more reserved or whatever. And I just always view that as a compliment because to me that embodied that I was centered or that I was grounded or that I was focused on what I was trying to do. And my grandmother had always said, you know, uh, when she mentioned my grandfather, she always mentioned excellence and greatness and striving mm -hmm. for greatness. And so, you know, making sure that I was on point with academics and taking care of, you know, my lessons in school mm -hmm. and making sure that my grade point average was a certain way, you know, because realistically my mom had actually said she said you know if you bring any bees home <laughs> no more basketball just so you know <laughs> you know so um i was you know was striving to make sure that i could you know get straight a's in school and then also just again thinking about striving for greatness striving for excellence you know what did my granddad do and what was it 
pertain to the life that he lived um, that I could focus on and that I could utilize to help me get to the next level, I would always think about that. I would always, you know, come back to he made some great sacrifices, not just for me, but for everyone, mm-hmm. but especially being my granddad, I just want to make sure, you know, that my family was proud of me. And I always just felt a very special connection to him through baseball, through basketball, through sports, through even with education. He actually was really big on um, supporting young people staying in school. That was one of his messages that he would always give to community kids cool. in the neighborhood and stuff. And he would give his his baseballs and his bats and his gloves away. We actually don't have any of that stuff because wow. he gave away all of it. I'm like, I wish he- After he was know, done playing? After, after uh, yeah, done? When, yeah, when he was done, my grandmother said he had a huge trunk of wow. baseballs and uh, bats and gloves and all that stuff is gone because he would give it away to neighborhood kids and kids in the community who didn't well, have it. Boy, you wonder what happened to some of that stuff, right? Right. Yeah, Whoa. we only had a few, a few very sacred pieces left. But boy, I always boy. like to think, you know, if he just the fact that that's what he wanted to do, I totally get the idea. I feel like that's more important, you know, giving back to the community and giving to young people. So, so for people who may be watching who don't know who Norman Turkey Stearns was, right. uh, he to to me there are several candidates that could be on if you want to call it the Mount Rushmore of, of Negro League Baseball, he would be on a short list. I mean, there there are a number. I mean, you know, the, obviously the Satchel Pages and the Josh Gibsons, Cool Papa Bell. I'll tell you what, he is right there with the Oscar Charlestons and all these. If you were going to come up with, you know, the, the four or whoever you wanted, you wanted to pick, he would be on that short list. Can you just tell, if you give a, tell people what, what your grandfather accomplished as a, uh, as a baseball player? Yeah, well, I mean, he was most well known for his home run hitting, and I think he batted over 400 three times in his um, career, and definitely batted over 300 um, for all the seasons that he played. But I know he was also someone who accomplished winning some batting titles, um, and he, he was, was also five, he was a five-tool player for sure. That's it. That's yeah. it. You got it. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. And um, he also captured seven home run titles um, mm-hmm. and played in four East West All Star games. I think he had 197 home runs. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, people would always talk about his power hitting. And one of the things that I remember from a lot of stories that I heard was people would say he hit the ball so far, <laughs> he hit it in somebody's kitchen, you know? <laughs> um, so that always stuck with me. I'm like, that's hitting the ball, right? That's that's a long ball right there. Uh, but he was extremely fast in center field. And, you know, growing up, when I was watching it, when I really fell in love with Tigers baseball, um, Curtis Granderson was our center oh, fielder. Okay. And so a lot of people would say, you know, there's a lot of comparisons that you can make between Curtis Granderson's speed in center field and my granddad's. Um, so just, you know, being a power hitter, um, and just being someone that could field any ball, you know, if, if they say he made, made the, uh, the hard balls look easy and the easy catches, you know, yeah. look really hard. Um, because, <laughs> yeah, you, know, right? you know, the degree of difficulty, you know, that, that takes and just the extreme athleticism that he had mm-hmm. uh, was always on display. So, you know, he, he was, definitely uh, he was elected to the Hall of Fame, the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, but he's also in a couple of others too, isn't he? Yeah, he's in five altogether. Um, National Baseball Hall of Fame, uh, Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame, African American Sports Hall of Fame, Kansas City Royals Hall of Fame, and the Michigan Sports Hall of Fame. Cool. Now, do you have, I know, uh, I'm sure you got to have a couple of stories your grandmother told you that might be uh, near and dear to you. You got any of those that you can lay on us? Uh, you want to hear like stories about his playing days or his stories from after that? Either one. How about one of each? Sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so my grandmother, the interesting thing about her is she did not go to his games when he was playing. Um, oh. And I think most of the time she was home with my 
mom and my aunt um, who are both still around and are amazing. They're actually singing the uh, the national anthem on Friday at the Tigers game because it's Negro Leagues weekend here this weekend. So um, they do that pretty much every year in honor of their father. So, um, you know, my grandmother wasn't at those games, but I did hear some stories from people who uh, either played alongside of him or were able to catch a game. And, um, you know, interesting, um, let me see which one I want to tell. <laughs> you know, and kind of going back to even something not even um, that happened on the field, even though they talked about the fact that he would talk to his bats when he was playing. And so that was one of the things that I kept hearing a lot of different um, players say and things that I've read about from historians who, you know, written a lot about that or whatever. So I thought that was interesting, but yeah. I was like, you know what? Any real athlete does that. Because yeah. even in basketball, you know, if I always shoot a shot, and it's going all around the rim. You know, you just like, get in there, ball, get, get in, in there. there. Yeah. Right? You got to give it that extra nudge. Yep. So I totally understand. I totally understand, you know, the connection that you would have to your bat, to the baseball, too, as well. And so, uh, you know, he, he would say funny things. Like, he would uh, tell the bat, well, I'm going to use you for firewood. You know, <laughs> you- <laughs> Threaten the bat, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Awesome. Just, and, uh <laughs> That, I think they say he also carried his bats around in a violin case. Too, really? Well. Yeah. That so, is cool. <laughs> yeah, just making sure that he could take extra care of him, I guess, you know. Um, but one <laughs> of my favorite cool. stories, is like, it actually doesn't have anything to do with him playing. It was the story that my grandmother told me about them going to a Tigers game together because that was his number one love, you know, even which is so interesting because even though he couldn't play, for the Tigers, uh-huh. the fact that he went to all of their games oh. when he could, you know, sat in the bleachers, and um, he was so competitive that actually he would come home early if they were losing. And so, uh, so this was the, during his playing days. But I think he went during his play days a little bit, but then after for sure. Okay, he was an avid, avid. I mean, he should have had season tickets because wow, he, was, cool. he was in there all the time with probably no one knowing. No. who he was and how he had contributed to the game himself and how he could have been right out there with him, you know? That's just fascinating. That's, that's the whole thing that, unfortunately, uh, we're never going to know now. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's disappointing uh, in so many ways. I mean, not just from a, you know, just a sh- straight-out, you know, uh, human uh, perspective, but just from a baseball fan's perspective, I mean, everybody would have loved to have seen Satchel Page face Babe Ruth and Josh Gibson face, you know, whoever. Now, they did some barnstorming, uh, you know, here and there, and that was part of how they made a living. Um, People like to take that and make it sound like it's something somehow bad. Oh, they are barnstorming. Yeah, well, most of the time they made more money <laughs> doing that than they did, you know, other way. Uh, did you, did your grandfather did he play um, in any Latin leagues? I believe I believe he did. Um, I think one of the historians from I think actually there's like a Sabre article about um, all of the places that he played, mm-hmm. and I know he played in. Um, Cali, and then he played in the Cuban League too as well. Um, so it seemed like he played pretty much everywhere that you could play. Right, most many of them did, and many of them when they went to Latin America found that um, that was uh, a little bit more inviting place than coming back here and putting up with all the baloney you had to put up with here. So That's you it. can't blame them when many of them, you know, didn't want to come back or kept going back year after year when they were told not to. So, uh, yeah, right. I mean, if you're treated like a normal human being for the most part, why are you going to, um, uh, you know, put up with the nonsense here? It just wasn't right. And like I said, that's something that I hope people get their get their heads around. This is not something that on a daily basis people for the most part today I mean unfortunately there is still some elements of it here and there but for the most part you don't have to deal with it quite the way they did a hundred years ago uh, and, and it's 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 um, something that it affected not just how they could perform where they could perform uh, who we were in front of 
it, it's it's just so many different aspects of it that I hope people can appreciate when it comes to uh, to that. So, you, yeah, uh, I don't even take it for granted. You know, like going to a restaurant nowadays mm -hmm. uh, and, and just traveling, for example, you know, from place to place and being able to stop certain places without feeling fear. You know, um, I think those are the things too that people forget. Um, when you learn about the Green Book, when you learn about I just you know, the like, Green Book, yeah. Yeah, it's just, there's just so much in terms of we evolved in many different ways, but also just, you know, being grateful for some of the opportunities that we have now. Um, but there is a lot more work to be done for sure. Um, and I'm sure as, as a teacher, you're, it's part of those things that you're trying to stress, I would guess, with, uh, especially with the age group. I think it's great that you're teaching uh, high school kids. Do you, um, do you have any plan? I mean, you, you've got to have enough material here. I know you do some writing. You, you do write with, uh, uh, you've written some articles for Baseball Reference and some other places. Do you have any, any uh, thoughts on, on putting together a book on any of this? You know, that's definitely something that's coming. Um, definitely thinking about, Good. you know, the brainstorming stages of that right now because there's so much to, to talk about. And, um, not just about my grandfather's baseball mm. playing days, but everything that intersects with that. Yes. Too, you know, in, in terms of history, in terms of his legacy, in terms of what that means for baseball, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of globally speaking, the human experience. Uh, there's so many different avenues, you know, looking at the trajectory of the of the black athlete, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I don't take it for granted when I see LeBron James or even, you know, Simone Biles or anybody that's competing at a high level right now. I don't take it for granted that the Negro Leaguers are the ones that actually help to break that color barrier within baseball. Boy. And then, you know, look at all the other sports and how they open up to as well. Yeah, I mean, that's an important perspective because baseball certainly a hundred years ago was the sport and it right. was it was the sport probably well into the 50s 60s maybe even the 70s i mean the rise of the nba didn't really start to happen until maybe the 70s into the 80s and certainly beyond that the nfl the same way i mean excuse me <clears throat> they were sports that people went to go see but it didn't have that same uh you know pull that baseball had with with society in, in, in general so uh, when these guys were playing baseball they were good enough athletes to play any sport really I'm sure your grandfather could have played a number any number of sports you could Jackie Robinson I mean he, he was the only four four letter men sport at UCLA ever <laughs> you know right. they, they could have and people but, never talk about that they only talk about him as a baseball, baseball. player yeah but baseball was the avenue because you could make money doing it. And that's really a lot of this is, is driven, I mean, in all aspects when it comes to sports. Um, it it kind of drives a lot of um, a, innovation and, and change and everything else. Sometimes they're slow to get around to it sometimes. But but it always is is important uh, role that it plays in, in society as well. And so um, baseball, like you, like you just mentioned, the fact that now baseball with the big wall <laughs> finally comes down <laughs> in 1947 and, and you know teams were still slow to make that change the teams who made it faster were more successful going into the 50s and 60s but then other sports took up that same uh, that same sort of uh, you know I guess uh, understanding that that this is not acceptable and they started to prosper as well. So it's it's interesting. College sports, I mean, all the way down the line. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, something that uh, sports does drive a lot. In, in I always society. wondered too, though. I wanted to ask your opinion. What do you think? If money wasn't involved, do you think it would have happened? You know, it's an interesting question. I, I've actually had that discussion with a few people because um, – there's two sides to that story. On one hand, why was there a color barrier? Obviously, prejudice, racism had a lot to do with it, right? But there were many guys who were playing, um, not all from the South, who also saw integration as, now I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> So, you know, there's that side of the money equation, right? You had people who were already there. And, you know, you see this in a lot of aspects. Look look at um, even today when it comes to immigration. 
people, some people view immigration, and it's not really what's going on here. I mean, innovation is what's taking away jobs, not so much immigration. But um, they view that as someone's going to come and take my job. So there's that side of it. But then I think what you're asking is, uh, did teams see a way that I can win now if I start to uh, integrate? And yeah, I think that there were uh, a number of teams, certainly the Giants, Brooklyn Dodgers, several others, the Pirates, you know, they said, go to it. I mean, heck, by the early 70s, I think it was, uh, the entire Pirates team was either uh, African American or Latino uh, that they put on the field one, you know, in, in, in the in early 70s, if not the late 60s. So, yeah, some teams embraced it. Some teams embraced it for sure. Now the teams are very, very slow. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think, what, the, the Red Sox were the last team to integrate? Yeah, and it's interesting, though. Uh, you know, the Yankees were a little slow to integrate, and those teams, by the time they were able to shift gears, they had some dry spells there for uh, a long time. You look at the teams that dominated in the uh, 50s and 60s. And that's the thing, you know, to me, the number one thing that uh, says that these guys were were good is the fact that when they came in, they were MVPs. They were Rookies of the Year. They were Cy Young Award winners. They were All-Stars, dozens of them. And, and they dominated, and they changed the fortunes of teams. They didn't just spring out of the sky, you know, <laughs> and become good. Right. They, they learned that playing in the Negro Leagues. Right. And That's so, what, you know, I was so sad about my grandfather. I feel like he was born a little bit too early. Boy. Because if he'd been born a little bit later, maybe, you know, he would have gotten his chance to play in the majors back then. And then you would have really have seen how he stacked up against other players, you know. But now we have to envision those things and look at the stats and compare and contrast. And it's fun to do that. But, um, That's you know, it's just interesting. Long, it's going to go on for a long time. Uh, right. There's so much more to uncover, not just uh, – with the players that we know of, but there's more and more. I mean, Sabre, they do a great um, effort at trying to do biographies, not just of the of the um, uh, players that people know about, but also everybody on that team. When, when Sabre does a book about, say, the, the 1948 World Series, Birmingham Black Barons, uh, mm -hmm. they are going right down to the, the bat boy. <laughs> You know, they're trying to tell you everything about that team, the, the front office, the, you know, the, the, so you can learn about these guys. I try to do that every day on Twitter. I try to put out something, a little something that, you know, somebody that somebody doesn't know about because there's so many stories to tell. There, there really, really are countless. And I hope people, um, I hope people want to hear them you know because it's important so you so you were you sent me that link on Hamtramck tell us a little bit about what's going on up there with that stadium yeah the big news is they uh, received 2.8 million dollars and call it historic Hamtramck Stadium and actually it was renamed after my grandfather uh, earlier in the earlier part of well, now it's 2021, so it was 2020 um, in the fall. And they had named it Terry Stern Field at Historic Hamtramck Stadium, which is unbelievable. Can't believe that still. <laughs> I'm just still getting used to it. Um, and I just always think about, you know, what would he think about that? You know, would he think that there would ever be a space named after him? Probably not, but um, it just, you know, it just goes to show you what can happen when you just dare to dream and, and dare to keep being yourself and, and being your best self at that. You always talk about being a good man, what's important to him. And I think that carried him a very long way. But the uh, stadium itself being renovated, it's, it's in pretty good shape right now anyways. It definitely needs some updates. Um, but there's, you know, there's been some games there. And there's a lot of people excited about wanting to play there too. And then they're thinking about transforming it into a space that will be uh, utilized not just for baseball, but for all types of community events and sports too as well. So uh, it's just a really awesome unifier in the community down there. And I think it'll be something that will, you know, bring a lot of joy uh, and also cultivate joy for a lot of young people and also people of all ages too. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm over the moon about this. And I know there's so many people that are. And for this to happen, this news to come out, 
the same week as uh, Negro Leagues Weekend, which will be at the end of this week. Um, you know, it's just phenomenal timing, and I'm sure that <laughs> there was some uh, intentionality with that too as well, but I'm just really excited about everything that's coming to fruition. Yeah, very, very cool. Uh, where is that mur that picture from? You're standing in front of a mural or a, something on a wall. Where is that from? Oh, yeah, this was actually from the first uh, Negro League celebration that the Tigers had, and the artist okay. painted it this of uh, my grandfather where um, they had to kind of create it from memory a little bit, but there's a, a few pictures that they were basing um, two of the poses off of with um, him in the center, the largest one, and then the one with him with the hat on um, in the suit dressed to the nines uh, are from, you know, actual photos that the artist was looking at, but the other two with him um, with his hands on his knees and probably in center field and then him swinging through um, the artist actually had to create that from memory and, and uh, using some combination stuff too as well. So cool. it's one of my favorite pieces. I have to have that up there. <laughs> so I know you've written uh, one of the things that, let me, let me put up that little graphic. One of the things that I keep, and we've touched on this a little bit, uh, is baseball reference putting out the announcements uh, just a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago now, about the Negro League's were major leagues and uh, yes <laughs> they were all along they were there's there's no question about it we've we've touched on some of the reasons why but you wrote an article for this what's your what's your thoughts I mean I know I know you probably get asked that question a lot because I I, I do I mean and I, I'm really nobody <laughs> so I imagine you do get asked that question a lot about it's almost like a some people are okay with it. Some people say, well, prove it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of thing, right. you know? Right. I think that, you know, it's pretty evident, as you mentioned before, and you've said it so many times in so many different ways since we've just been talking this time, um, that this should be like a fact. This should already mm -hmm. be known. This is already evident. If you look at their statistics, if you look at, um, you know, the athleticism and the creativity and just everything that you think of when you think of baseball, these players possessed all of that talent, you know? And so the fact that it's even a conversation where people might be arguing about, you know, whether this is um, valid or not, you know, how credible the Negro Leagues were, this goes to show you, you know, the, the misinformation mm -hmm. and also how, um, you know, that's kind of, it, it's, it's, to be honest, it's rooted in, in white supremacy you know, just the idea that um, these leagues were lesser. These leagues were not really, you know, almost, I was reading a couple comments online. I know you're never supposed to read the comments, uh, but I saw some people talking about the Negro Leagues literally as if, oh, well, you know, now they might as well add Paul Bunyan too as well, right? right? And so, you know, just comments like that. I know some people online are just very unhappy and post whatever, just be seen and get likes and whatever, but I think there is something to be said about the fact that there are, you know, so many people who, number one, didn't even know what the Negro Leagues were mm -hmm. or still are, to be honest. Um, there's so many people that don't know my grandfather's name, never heard of them, never heard of the Detroit Stars, and they could be local right here in the city, mm -hmm. too, as well. Um, and so that, that erasure that we were talking about before, just completely wiping out the history and, and the accomplishments and the accolades and the stories of an entire group of people. I mean, it, it really speaks to the level of dehumanization that was going on at the time and that continues to, to rear its ugly head even today. Um, so, you know, I was very, 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 very happy. I still am happy. I'm going to celebrate that until the end of time. The fact that, you know, the Negro Leagues are major leagues, but I, I really feel personally that it needs to be more than, you know, a historical correction it actually needs to go further than that so that people understand, you know, the equity issues, the equality issues, um, the dehumanization, systemic racism, all the glass ceilings, even what you mentioned about your wife, you know, still being treated a certain way because mm -hmm. of her accent, mm -hmm. right? And so really understanding the human experience and how to come together mm -hmm. um, and how to respect other people and not just respect them or tolerate them, but really uplift them, mm -hmm. you know, through baseball. Baseball can be the bridge for that. So that's what I'm really hoping to see 
as we continue to move on. Because even people like um, CeCe Sabathia is talking about his real experience now that he's retired, mm -hmm. you know, pertaining to how rough it was for him to play. And he didn't play during the Negro Leagues, right? He didn't play during the Jim, era, Jim Crow era. And this is like, this is a guy I grew up watching, you know, this is somebody that just recently retired as, as far as I'm concerned, you know? And so the fact that he's talking about some of the things that he had to go through and endure and other people are starting to be more vocal about those things too, it just goes to show you how much we carry within us sometimes that we don't always share um, because there's really not a space to that's safe um, for Black Americans and Black athletes. And that needs to change too as well. Boy, that's a great point uh, about sometimes you, you watch, I imagine there's many athletes who are going through the day-to-day -day and they're doing their thing and you don't know, uh, you know, what they're dealing with um, in their personal life outside, you know, outside of the field or the stadium or the, or the arena. Uh, and, and I think fans lose track of that. <laughs> You know, I, I had Jeff Fry on here uh, a couple of, you know, maybe six weeks back, former Major League Baseball player, who was telling me, you know, kind of that same thing. I mean, he, he dealt with many things um, over his career that he, um, people didn't realize it. <laughs> and, right. and, 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 you know, I, I think people need to understand now you layer on top of that some of these things that are are just obviously from a, a you know uh, a racist or bigoted slant to it and and many people I'm, I'm sure don't want you know you don't want to acknowledge it you want to do whatever so you think it's not affecting them but I'm sure it is I, I, I don't have any doubt and yet that's what they have to deal with and then some people will say well they're making all this money well, yeah, no, exactly. that, that, that doesn't give anybody the right to treat somebody, you know, right. that way. That that's just that's just not that's just not right. But it, it is what it is. I need to. You should talk to um, Rob Ruck, Professor Ruck, because man, I'll tell you what: the books that he's written and the, the issues that he digs into are are fascinating, and many of them have to do with the social and um, you know, economic and other aspects. He teaches a class at the University of Pittsburgh, the history nice. of sport, but it's also through a, uh, a lens of um, kind of the whole, you know, macro, you know, look at, at how sports inter interacts with so many different things. So it's, it's, it's fascinating. And, and the other thing that people, I think, um, don't understand, the Negro Leagues affected today's baseball immensely in many ways, not just on, on the side of the athletes who were uh, African-American, but it was the pipeline into Major League Baseball from the Caribbean. And that's where many of those players, and now you look at the dominance, yes. the rise of the, you know, the Latin players from, you know, uh, Venezuela, Dominican Republic, certainly, many other countries down there. And, and the Negro Leagues had a huge hand in that. They, they really did. So um, what are you, what's your plans next? What are you going to be, uh, what are you going to, oh, you know what, before we, well, I got to hear about this. You were on the, you were on the Josh Gibson MVP card art campaign. You were one of the judges. Right. Had a great panel of judges on there. Tell us a little bit about that. It was just such an honor to do that, um, to see the art that they came up with. And I saw that there were artists from all over the world competing yeah in that competition, um, especially knowing that that pertains to a Negro leaguer, that was so special because it didn't have to be about my granddad, right? Um, Sean Gibson, who was a great, great grandson of Josh Gibson talks about that too. When we talk about one player, we're really talking about all of the Negro leaguers, you know, the men, the women, everybody involved with that. Um, because when you start talking about one, you start showcasing their story, then it elevates the conversation altogether. So. Mm -hmm. It was really cool to see, you know, the Josh Gibson um, art competition to see what people came up with. They were so creative with uh, utilizing right. you know, history and nostalgia. And some of them I felt like, I'm like, this one's so cool. I feel like this should come with some Cracker Jacks and some bubble gum. You know what I mean? Like, it was just, it, you could feel baseball when you were looking at mm -hmm. those cards. 
instead of just visually seeing something, you could actually feel something. Like those artists had immense talent and just you and know how many, unbelievable. How many people even knew that there's a bunch of people out there making their own baseball cards, right? I didn't even know most, that. Most really? people don't. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, I, I looked up a few things because you know just poking around on the internet. The internet has been fantastic for learning about my granddad. Mm -hmm. For somebody that never had a chance to talk to him, mm -hmm. there's people all over the world creating things that you wouldn't even think about, you know, and um, just the fact that I was able to start seeing some baseball cards that people were actually making on their own on eBay. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, whoa. So I always show my mom and my grandma when she was still here. I'm like, have you seen this one? Have you seen this one? Have you seen that one? Stuff, They're like, yeah. no, never, you know. So now just with Twitter, you know, taking off and Instagram too as well, um, we just see so, so much stuff created that is unbelievable. The talent is just Insane. You wouldn't think that there would be that many different ways that you could uh, depict it. You know, that's some of the things that makes this made that difficult was there's just a limited number of images available. So right. people had to get a little bit creative. I imagine and I, I don't know what your what your grandmother might have in the way of any pictures of your grandfather, but they would be yeah, a treasure. Yeah. They would be a treasure <laughs> because yeah, there's mom, just not a lot. Yeah, there's not too many, but my mom and my aunt do have um, the, you know, family pictures um, that they've taken and even, even pictures that, you know, were um, taken by other people that have my mom and my aunt when they were very, very young in those pictures too as well. So it's really cool to see, you know, the family photos. There's just a few, not as many as today. I mean, today we take that for granted, right? That we have thousands of photos on our our phones, um, but you know the, the few images that we do have, mm -hmm. very very sacred, very special. I bet, I bet. So one of the things I wanted to make sure people uh, are are aware of with you, I mean you've got a pedigree here, right? You've got you know your website out there, your Hall of Fame DNA, uh, but you, as we've talked about, have taken taken that next step. Uh, in, in trying to, you know, I guess in a way continue his legacy and so forth. Tell us a little bit about, I know you're involved in uh, uh, over the years with uh, some of the global efforts on uh, diversity, race relations, things like that. Tell us a little bit about that because I think that that's, that's an important part of what you're doing and how you're kind of in a way honoring your grandfather, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I was younger, I didn't get it. To be quite honest, I um, I knew that segregation was detrimental. I knew that we had, you know, these horror stories of the past. Um, but I felt like, you know, we've come so far. Look at all the things that we can do um, as a race and as a society together. In high school, pretty much that was my feeling. Um, as I shifted into consciousness by going away to college and experiencing a lot of racism myself, um, it, it really put me in a different space and I started to see things with a different lens and I had a different perspective because now I was encountering people who, you know, expected me to be a certain way because I was black mm -hmm. or expected me to talk a certain way, you know, so when they would hear me speak, you know, oh, wow, you're very uh, articulate. Well, don't you, know? you, you probably hate that word, right? All right, I might well, so well, I'm you're very well spoken. Wait, what, like, you're not supposed to be? I mean, come on. <laughs> right. And then, you know, I'm noticing my peers that I was around that were mostly white were never, ever, ever having those conversations, right? And right. so you always want to think the best of people and just kind of shrug it off or, just, you know, I'm, I'm a very positive person in terms of thinking about, you know, things in an optimistic way. So I like to, you know, just kind of say, oh, that's okay, you know, whatever, and move on. But over time, you know, it's like you're 20, then you're 25 and you're 30. I'm 38 years old now. And, you know, having gone through, like I said, college and just life experience, mm -hmm. becoming a teacher, and then all the things that have been happening in the world with social movements and all of the awesome, you know, art that has been created where, you know, voices that were underrepresented for a very long time and silence for a very long time are now coming to the forefront with you know, all these awesome movies or there's art, there's just things popping up all over the place and, and stories that we never heard growing up. I mean, it's really been an awakening for me. And so one thing I realized very quickly is my connection to that in terms of my connection with my grandfather and how I can utilize that 
to not just honor him, but also to honor everyone who came before us that you know has fought to try to help under people try to help people understand you know everyone is worthy. Everyone mm-hmm. is 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 um, someone that's deserving um, of peace and love and respect and you know compassion and all of those things. So really, that's what the website is all about. That's what becoming a teacher was all about. That's why I became a coach too, as well. That's why I've been involved with all these efforts to, you know, try to help people understand how to heal racism and, and to understand, you know, the state of the world. Right? So if I'm doing something now, my focus is very heavily tied to, uh, you know, uplift empowerment uh, through consciousness, but also, you know, we have to talk about some, some hard things in yeah. time and have a critical understanding of, the history of our country and and the ways that um, you know society has been very violent in upholding white supremacy and mm-hmm. um, we need to move forward in positive ways and we can we can we have every tool now we have so much more to work with than past generations have mm-hmm. it's unbelievable with the amount of access to books and workshops and. Oh. conversations and stories and everything you know there's so much out there to bring us together we have to use it absolutely i think it's great i i wish you i wish you all the best with that i, I hope uh that <clears throat> there continues to be some positive change in all this and and like you mentioned and I talk, talk about this all the time with people both on here and outside of here you can't not talk about it and it, it, it's un, unfortunately it's part of of kind of who we are as a country and and you have to kind of do uh learn from it but you can't just pretend it didn't happen because okay. that's not helping it, it, I, I don't think it does but uh I, I wish you well we got to get you hooked up with the undefeated and some of these other uh, people I, w- I would love to see you on there that'd be awesome i mean uh, there's there's a lot of things you're doing i think that would fit with a lot of people that i've talked to because like i said I'm, I'm trying to have people on here not just about um the, the negro leagues and baseball history but but you know a lot of things that people have passions about i mean and and sometimes those things involve sports most of the time but uh not always and like we talked about it's kind of a good way to uh approach a lot of topics that you might not be able to otherwise so (laughs) but i do i I wish you well i i hope that you keep on going and you keep teaching the next generation of people that's going to take the take the uh the flag to the next uh the next hill you know (laughs) absolutely we can do it we can do it uh this was great this is a lot of fun uh anything else you want to talk about you you uh you uh have anything else you're working on right now that you want to let us know about or anytime you want to come back on here down the road we'll you know you got some new stuff i would love to have you back on here and talk about some things too so yeah definitely i'm working on the book now so you know we'll love to come back on and talk about the book or anything else you know pertaining to just like you said, you know, with sports, baseball, I, I love that people gravitate towards the story of my granddad because of baseball, but I hope they walk away from it realizing, like, it's so much more than that. Absolutely. It, next it, uh, next week, I'm going to have on Anika O'Rock uh, to talk about um, her work and her book. She was an artist that I'm sure you're uh, aware of through the Josh Gibson card art campaign, but she's also written... A, uh, a book on the women of uh, all-American women's baseball, all-girls all professional baseball league, and she's involved. She's put out some really cool stuff lately about uh, uh, how that even interacted in Latin America as well. I didn't even realize that some of those those uh, women went down there and played against women's teams in Cuba. I mean, that's pretty cool, you know? <laughs> that's kind of stuff. That, yeah. So, so so much out there to, to learn. I hope people learn something new every day and pass it on and, and try to be a positive influence on things. And that's I, I really appreciate you coming on here. I think you are a positive influence on a lot of people. Uh, and I hope, uh, I hope that... Uh, your 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 students uh i'm sure they they love you to death i'm sure you know so <laughs> but i hope that they're that they're learning something and they they're doing the next the next step as well because that's the next generation's coming fast every day so um i appreciate your time thank you so much vanessa
Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. You have a good night. Bye-bye. All right. You too.